So, I think we will restart the sessions. So I think we are going to restart. Please take some seats. Please take seats. B. So, I think we're going to restart now, and we have the next session. It's all quite a lot of things about indoor also, but prior we start this, um, I can assume that on this edge there, the coffee man gets a lot of extraction. It is very hard to get the people from the queue of the coffee man away. And what I would like to say, this kind of idea of the coffee man was brought by, um, by Jubilabs from Hamburg, and we have to say thank you for this. On the other hand, if it's, it's so popular, somehow we need to switch it off, I think, to bring the people now here to our audience. <laughs> Nevertheless, we have the next talk now from um, Matthias Jürst, and I think it's already loaded, and I think it will be also quite interested, interesting. So please come and give us an insight. Also, by the way, the app, which was produced, I think you will mention it also yeah. from the webcam, is also done here. So many thanks, and the floor is for you. Thank you. So, I'm happy to open up the afternoon session. I hope you had uh, something to eat and now some coffee. So, I will continue the, the session or the, the, the topic on uh, indoor navigation and give you some insights on the business area where we are in. We are dealing with trade shows, which are a very special segment, very dynamic segment, and I give you, I intend to give you some some insights on the projects we did with positioning and navigation in uh, large halls and uh, on trade shows and what went wrong, what might work or what will work in the future. But to start to give you some insights 
what we are doing in general and where we came from. So Heidelberg Mobile, you might think, eh, what the name and how they do they relate to uh, navigation services. So we are quite old company in the business. And what we started in, uh, in 2005, building up a mobile uh, information system for Heidelberg back then. In that times, before iPhone, we had been one of the f few companies on the globe that had a infrastructure, mobile service and data. The only other one was Google. And so we are, have been quite a while in the, in the business of providing mobile location-based services, previously uh, quite strongly in the tourism domain. But uh, in the recent years, we uh, migrated or opened up uh, new business segments. And currently, we are doing three, three, uh, three or we're targeting three uh, segments. One is event industry. There we are provider of the largest trade show applications. For example, the IFA was done by us, or the ER trade show, the CBIT tra uh, trade show, Hanover Fair. So the large German uh, trade show applications has been done by my company. And there, there this aspect of orientation is of importance. And then we have a segment enterprise mobility. And some of the technologies that we are using in our applications are is, uh, open to the public to be used and enhance mobile applications with indoor navigation services. Here's an example of what we do. That was CBIT uh, this year. And as you can see, for large trade shows, People are in a hurry. They need to inform themselves about the new products, competitors, meet the people they know, uh, um, uh, take care of their business network. And so orientation, navigation is of great importance. And on the other hand, the, the trade show business is uh, a very delicate business because the spatial situation changes quite rapidly. You can imagine. Uh, before the trade show, the hall is almost empty, and suddenly, two, three days uh, before the trade show starts, then huge lo logistical processes started, and every uh, company is building up his, his booths, and the security is going around, and you have the catering service. So there's a huge dynamic, and we try to deal with this dynamic with our competencies and with the help of partners. What we do is, uh, or we have, we are, as company, focusing on mapping and routing. That's the core of our business in this uh, segment. The positioning is not done by us. There we are evaluating uh, from uh, the different possibilities. You have seen uh, previously the, the positioning with uh, image recognition and then the representation in an augmented reality view. But there are many, many other technical possibilities to get a sort of precise position indoors. And the main, uh, main, main challenge for, for us is, on the one side, the positioning. On the other side, to get precise and accurate spatial data. And we've seen in the previous talks that uh, we had been uh, yeah, discussing on OpenStreetMap and crowd-based uh, spatial data. But in many business scenarios, that does not work because the data is proprietary. You cannot enter the buildings. They are in private hand. So you need other means to get this sort of spatial data to then build upon them uh, some navigation use cases. And what we try to do is to combine the spatial, the GIS world with this, all these uh, mapping around buildings and all this exterior data with uh, the ins inside world, so the CAD world, where architects have constructed the buildings and they have some sort of data format available, CAD files. Um, and what we do is we combine all these different so sorts of data to one spatial representation. What is done there is you aggregate the data, you need to, you need to do some georeferencing, you need to do a validation, and often the data is too crowded. There are a lot of information inside that is not necessarily usable or feasible for navigation purposes. For example, some, some wiring of uh, electricity or some pipes for the water, that's not relevant. That might be in the CAD data. So you need to get rid of it. You need to generalize the data and then do a proper visualization. If you deal with indoor location-based service or navigation services, you have um, four different domains. Uh, that you need to address. 
on the one side, I mentioned already, the spatial data, where does the data come from? Especially uh, in indoor scenarios, you need quite precise spatial data and you need data that is up to date. Um, in, the spa in, in indoor scenarios during the day, some doors might be closed or in the evening, um, yeah, there might be a security restrictions that you are not allowed to enter certain areas and for navigation purposes, this needs to be reflected in the spatial data. One example, for example, at, uh, at CB trade show, whenever uh, some of you might have been there, there are the, the parties in, in the, later in the evening and then the security is closing in the hall some, uh, some doors and only one or two are open and uh, quite often you are searching around which fucking door is open, how do I get out of the hall and go, go to bed. So those are the problems that you have to deal with um, on the spatial data side. From the positioning side, there are different aspects um, um, on the technology side. So for example, you need, uh, if you want to provide indoor location-based service, you need to have an almost or precise position. But the more precise position you want to get, the more expensive it's, it is. And often you are then in the balance, how much can an infrastructure provider, how much can a trade show owner afford for this trade show? So you need to balance precision versus cost. And then you have the user side for precise position. You need, or the, um, the devices need to compute quite often uh, the different uh, sensor information to one aggregated position, and that's energy, uh, the energy consumption is quite high. And then in a, in a trade show scenario, if you compute uh, um, the a precise position, but the battery is drained after two hours, then uh, your user might also be, not be very happy. So that's uh, the area of positioning, how to get this position. On the other hand, in, the, in, uh, in consumer scenarios, then you are in, in the difficulties that uh, you want to address a large audience, but we all know the devices are getting manifold, so you have variations of Android uh, operating systems on device form factors with different sensors, with different precision of information that is gathered by the sensor, the calibration, and there you need to see uh, um, which audience you are targeting and which devices you are targeting and where is the restriction that you limit yourself. For example, if you go for a Wi-Fi based positioning, then you might be out of luck on iOS or if you go for a beacon positioning, a couple of months ago there had not, not been a beacon uh, equivalent on Android or on, on Microsoft there is still no beacon uh, equivalent available, so you need to deal with this aspect as well. And then the, the fourth dimension is, of course, the user experience. Uh, we have had been speaking about maps in the, in the, in the, in the previous talks that we have, uh, want to have nice maps. But for indoor scenarios, the indoor buildings are quite complex. You have different floors. You have different layers. And the user situation is, especially in trade shows, you want, don't want to stare on the, on the map all the time because you need to go there. You need to see the different uh, other ex exhibitors. So you have to be very careful how the, the user experience is integrated or the, the spatial information is integrated into a nice and uh, yeah, good user experience. And then the, the fifth dimension is the administration and the cost of uh, administering uh, yeah, position infrastructure, the mapping infrastructure, because um, a beacon uh, as such costs a euro or two, so that's not uh, very expensive, but it runs out of battery after, depending on the signal frequency, three months, two years, and then you need to replace it, and that's a process that is, of course, also time and cost intense. If you consider different positioning possibilities on a wireless spectrum, there are um, yeah, different approaches. The basic approach is you have a sensoring or a, a transmitting device that's transmitting some position and you have a receiver and then you get this device is connecting to this uh, um, submitting uh, entity that's a called cell of origin. If you combine this with signal strength, then you can define the distance from the sender to the receiver. If you then enhance it with uh, how many signals and how many transmitters you get, then you go to the fingerprinting, and then the, 
The most complex one is if you go for triangulation on trilateration that you define the angles of uh, signals that you get. And depending on the approach, it's getting more and more complex. It gets more and more fragile and more and more error prone. And you need to define and see how much precision do you need for the use cases, for the user experience, and how much budget do you have. So on the, on the positioning uh, technologies, there are a wide array of uh, possibilities that you can go for. Of course, GNNS is uh, the, the, the method uh, to choose for outdoor positioning. And uh, the receivers on the devices are getting more and more uh, or getting better and better. So in some trade show halls, the GPS uh, is still working because the halls are not that, uh, the walls are not that thick. Then you can go for uh, positioning with a um, 3D network, uh, carrier-based positioning. In LTE, there is a specific lo location protocol that one can use. Then another approach would be uh, choosing Wi-Fi for positioning. But uh, Wi-Fi in trade shows, uh, if you have ever been to a technical conference, every exhibitor has his own Wi-Fi. And then you have the experience that uh, you have 300, 400 different Wi-Fi networks in one hall. So the, the wireless spectrum is totally polluted, and you won't get any connectivity at all. Then different uh, tags or marker-based approaches. For example, the most prominent one is with iBeacon or Eddystone or like more classical one with QR tags or image markers. And then there is a wide range of other uh, approaches, for example, using the magnetic field. A very promising one is using inertial sensors on the device. And as we have seen, uh, this, uh, uh, the previous talk, doing image rec recognition and then uh, using the, the camera for the positioning. We did in the last couple of years uh, various beacon scenarios at trade shows, and I want to share with you some, some insights on how the, those projects went and what were, have been the pitfalls, especially focusing on the trade show scenario. And as I mentioned, in trade shows, you have this time constraint that you have only two or three days where the, before the trade show when the spatial setup has been built to deploy uh, wireless or beacon infrastructure. So it's very time consuming. And um, the spatial situation is changing. And the wireless infrastructure is changing. You're building it up. And you need to be uh, yeah, on, the, on the process side. You need proper tools to do a deployment very fast, to do the mounting of the device, the configuration of the, the beacons. Uh, whether which major or minor uh, sensors they are sending. So that's a very yeah, a critical process that needs to be very efficient. Nowadays, almost all beacon provider has now his own application to do this a little bit better. Quite often they have, for example, no map installed so that you need to see on the, on the paper map where I'm putting the beacon. So that's a thing that co could be optimized in the future. And of course, you need to take care of the configuration of the beacon setup as such. Then a very challenging thing is with the current beacon setup, most beacon providers are, require some online connectivity to, uh, to see a, a beacon is quite a, a dumb, uh, small thing, sending out an ID. And the infrastructure of the beacon provider is then searching for this idea ID and then triggering some information, for example, presenting an ad or uh, jumping to an URL on the web. But um, those systems are currently targeted for normal deployment with an average load. But if you run a trade show with 200, 300 people, 300,000 people a day generating a lot of traffic on this infrastructure, and so suddenly you get uh, uh, in, the, in the position that the, the you, the device receives an ID, but the backend infrastructure is not capable to load or to handle the load of, of this in, uh, setup. And then the experience is quite bad because uh, it takes uh, two, three minutes until the notification pops up and the user is asking, oh, what the hell is going on? It doesn't work because of the, this different level of, um, of yeah, 
load and uh, connectivity. Then for beacons, one must have in mind that beacons are intended and tailored for push messaging. And one can exploit them for uh, positioning purpose, but the initial intent was to provide some means to engage users, to engage mobile users, to get their attention. And um, most uh, beacon infrastructure providers have their system tailored for these push message messaging services and not for the navigation services. So the setup, uh, the configuration, the positioning of the beacons, that's currently not in there. There might be in the near future, but currently the backend services of those beacon providers are mainly tailored for campaigns and push messaging. Then another thing is the user experience. As I said, it's mainly tailored for uh, push messaging and not for the navigation purpose. Quite often the software development kits that you get from the beacon providers are tailored for this advertisement domain and not giving a coordinate back or uh, triggering some information that some, uh, the map pops up or stuff, stuff like that. Another example or the, some other uh, things I want to share with you is on Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi um, is quite ubiquitous. Uh, almost every uh, trade show has a, a Wi-Fi network in different levels. And for Wi-Fi positioning, you can have two technical approaches. One is a client-side approach that on the client uh, or the mobile client is computing the position based on different Wi-Fi routers he sees around or uh, different signal strengths he gets. That's the client-side approach. And then there is a server-side approach where some central box is uh, sensing around which Wi-Fi, uh, which mobile devices he can see at a certain point in time at a location and then is computing the position out of that. For the client-side approach, one has to have in mind that uh, to, to get a uh, precise position and a uh, uh, precise uh, radio signal strength map, you need to map uh, the location. And that's in the trade show business also a quite complex process, like in the beacon setup. So you have a very short time frame to measure everything. And uh, the difficulty is here in this setup that you uh, might have measured uh, the surrounding of uh, of a hall, how many Wi-Fi you can see, but the situation changes because at nine o'clock uh, in the morning, every exhibitor is coming to his booth, and then the first thing, he, what he does, he switch on his own Wi-Fi, and suddenly the complete setup is in, in a different state, and um, the, the positioning approach quite often cannot handle this flexibility and uh, the instant that uh, suddenly uh, two or three hundred more Wi-Fi access points with different uh, signals are popping up. On the server-side approach, you have the challenge that there are different uh, techn technologies from Cisco and all other Wi-Fi carriers are working on that to have centralized positioning engines on their back end that measure via their routers the different positions of the mobile clients. But to use this on the mobile client, you need to have some sort of connectivity that I'm, as a mobile client, can ask a server, say, oh, I'm a device from Matthias, uh, give me the position map that I can put it on the map or get a route to, I don't know, to a destination. And for this, you need to have some connectivity. And often in trade shows, the connecti connectivity is quite poor, and then you get also some latency effects. Another thing that I mentioned earlier is device and operation system support. Currently, on iOS, you are not able to use a client-side approach, as Apple has locked this uh, couple of operating systems versions before. Uh, one can, can imagine that sooner or later they come up with their own uh, approach on that, or working on that. Another thing is uh, yeah, the accuracy and latency f for uh, centralized positioning uh, technologies, if you have a massive load on the network, we, can, we have experience on, in, in Hanover, we do a positioning with the Cisco infrastructure, it takes some, sometimes three or four minutes for the central server to compute all these positions and to get a single position of the user back, and three or four minutes in a pedestrian scenario is not the way to go for, so then some improvements need to be done. So conclusion, 
currently there is no silver bullet for indoor positioning at trade shows. Um, yeah, one need to assemble a different different technologies depending on the spatial setup the trade show is in, the use cases you want to propagate or use utilize in your mobile application, whether it's more on the messaging side or whether it's more on the real navigation side. And what we try to do is we try to mix different approaches. One approach that has a broad coverage provides a medium precise position with some hotspots where you have very precise position and then you can, can yeah, have a good user experience. And what's also important that you have always a fallback solution and the fallback solution is quite often the user himself give him good possibilities to, to orientate himself on a map or in a, in a different setup that you say I'm at IBM now or I'm at I don't know where and then uh, that's a thing to go for. All right, so that's for the moment. Uh, the experience I want to share with you guys. Uh, I'm open for question. Good talk. Any point? I think also all the points were very, very realis realistic in that sense that events are exactly that. The very last minutes, things are there, being forgotten, being set up. Also, we are human bodies with a lot of water. Exactly. Walls are empty and suddenly... Change uh, yeah. dramatically the, the Wi-Fi landscape. Hmm. Um, and that's it. No other point? Oh, we were so suppressed. It was quite, quite wide and also a good describing one. So the current, there's not, let's say, the solution currently, but there is one point. Hi, I'm Gregor. It strikes me that um, there's maybe a different problem. Well, there's a problem, but it's different. That is, to the trade show organizers need to be stricter on Wi-Fi routers or something. And actually, your locations would be solved by that, but also the things like the connectivity, you know, if they're supplying the Wi-Fi and saying exhibitors can't have theirs or limiting them. Some are doing this, then they have the, the restrictions, only use public Wi-Fi, only broadcast on this channel with this uh, uh, power range. So some of them have this. Unfortunately for the tech conferences, uh, the trade show providers are not in a strong position. They want to have the exhibitors. And then there's, I need Wi-Fi to demonstrate my own solution. I don't want to pay a fortune for your public wife or your the official one. I need to bring mine, otherwise I won't come. And then, especially the, the large tech trade shows, then they, they are not strong enough to, to, to push uh, or to, to restrict uh, to an official Wi-Fi setup. Hi, my name is Amir. I have a question about uh, the beacons. So first of all, you need to have the Bluetooth turned on, right? So yep. uh, that's one thing. Secondly, uh, what's the conversion rate you see there? How many people do click on the notifications? How do, you, how do they perceive that? 30 to 40 percent, that's... 40 to 50. Yeah. Usually you, have, you, you should have some communication and uh, when the user is installed the mobile application, they are, if you want to have a better service, enable your Bluetooth, and then we can provide you more precise uh, position information, or you can have some benefit uh, for advertisement or for coupons. So there's the new technology needs to be always aligned with a communication strategy to to inform the user what's going on. Uh, also, there's a lot of data collected in the background, and the user should be informed that this is done and that he can switch off the position technology, for example. So that's 40% of the people who installed the app, right? No, uh, all of, all from the install base, 40% then oh. have Bluetooth enabled. And the install base, that's also a matter of communication whether the app is in time ready. We did the small application for this event, the small hack. Uh, unfortunately, on iOS, we submitted it on Monday. It's not there yet, so. <laughs> On the other hand, this is really, um, the really, really realistic part. That's very often the traditional IT solutions are too small, or too, too, too slow, not dynamically enough. If I would have a change because Lufthansa starts to strike. So what to do then? So a lot of things in these event parts are still, let's say, in a way, not so flexible. 
So it's also very difficult if I just take a picture, and I have a picture here, and I would like to pass this picture to Thomas here, just to do something else, send it to the world. We know that the simple passing a, a picture is, is currently not easy. And uh, there are some techniques, but uh, yeah, like Android Beam, but they're simply not yet known. Yeah. But maybe there is also next 10 years, the uh, next generation of thoughts, and people are start to want to see something new, and then they're getting uh, excited about this. Thanks very much again for this talk, Herr Kutlu. We got an also another talk. Um, another space where indoor, I think, is quite also very useful uh, is uh, in, let's say, train stations, public transport. Most people don't want to stay or live in a station, of course. There are some, but this is the exception, of course. And uh, the other platform is also like OpenStreetMap because they, there is a lot of activity um, and it's quite public. So these parts are on the one hand side indoors, also sometimes even underneath in the undergrounds. We did a lot of experiments on the DroidCon 2012. We had also uh, one example with a barometer. So we saw that the undergrounds go up and down and we used it uh, to do some measurements. And um, we can also see now what Mansdifal is doing. Just starting. Mm -hmm. Good start. yeah. Thanks very much also for coming again and for this presentation. Up, the floor is up to you. and welcome to my presentation. Uh, my name is Emra Kutlu and I am working at Mens TV. Mens is a software company and a service provider from Bavaria. And we are also part of the Dynamo project. The Dynamo project is sponsored by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. And we are participating in the development of an door-to-door -door routing. Our approach is an vector-based map with an indoor visualization and um, routing. Our goals are primarily to serve a, um, a service for mobility-impaired people and, of course, to improve our widely used journey planner. Let's have a look at our contents. I want to answer some question, questions concerning the data. So where is the data from? We do use what are the requirements and um, how is our data processed? Then we would take a look at our example station and uh, show you some a routing example and the mapping process. Afterwards, I would like to talk about the visualization, how we do visualize the data, what are our current approaches, and a short comparison of bitmap and vector tiles. Um, finally, I would uh, talk about some problems and future tasks we do see. So first, let me talk about our motivation. Um, we want to get from A to B. And uh, often, especially inside the station building, we um, have some um, limitations, like fixed staircase, for example, um, which is a big problem, especially for mobility-impaired people. So we have our requirements to the data and uh, want data which is available inside the building, so in the visualization with in the data. And with that, I would like to show you our data process. Um, we are using OpenStreetMap data. OpenStreetMap is widely used and well known. Um, it's a large geo database which stores geographic data, geometries, and their attributes. Um, we do download this data via Overpass API or GeoFabric. You can Google for them and find them uh, very fast. Um, then comes the interesting uh, point. We have an import. Uh, which, uh, with which we do extract, we do uh, extraction. So we get out all the important data which is uh, relevant for uh, routing and rendering. Um, routing relevant data is all the nodes and ways, um, especially public transport relevant, uh, like um, uh, platforms, like ways, like streets, like um, escalators, elevators, and uh, stairs, and. Um, Rendering relevant data is uh, all the data which is important to recognize the scene and the environment, like um, 
uh, green spaces, water areas, buildings, uh, station buildings especially, um, but also stairs and uh, escalators, for example. Afterwards, we have a processing of the data. So uh, we do classify the features by type, um, and uh, the, the features get extra attributes. At this point, we don't have any other data source, so all the extra attributes are calculated out of the OpenStreetMap uh, data, so out of their futures. Um, these extra attributes are, um, for example, means of transport, directions, speed limitations, or um, um, things like that, yes. Then uh, we do have a DIVA model, of course. The DIVA model is a company in turn uh, stop model which, with which the, our customers, local transport authorities, do um, model their trips, their, their stops, their stop positions, their platforms, and of course the trip data. When this both come together, the data, the source, OpenStreetMap, and this DIVA model, then we do have, we do reference them together and do have an output which is routable. This um, finally is all sums up in our EFA, that's our journey planner, um, which is available for mobile and for desktop. So this shortly um, shows how our data process is. Now let's have to uh, look at uh, example station. This uh, autophoto shows the Karlsplatz in Munich. It's one of uh, Munich's beautiful hotspots, and um, it's also a large traffic junction. What this picture not shows is that directly under this um, uh, le ground level, we do have five more levels. So we do have, for example, in the level minus one, this Stachus Passagen, which is uh, announced at Europe's largest uh, shopping mall, underground shopping mall, of course. Then we have two more mezzanine floors, and the railway and the subvent, all of them on different levels. It's the uh, same scene like uh, earlier. Um, what we do see here is a um, screenshot, actual screenshot out of JOSM, the Java OpenStreetMap editor. And on one hand, it looks a bit confused because we um, can't see very much. On the other hand, we, we do see here that there's, a, there's very much data available. Um, like I mentioned here, we have, we have the ground level and five more levels. All the features are overlapping. And um, let's clean up for clarity the scene a bit and put it side by side and filter the data. Um, now I would like to uh, note you that how, how complete and how detailed the data is mapped already. And this proves, in my opinion, that OpenStreetMap is predestined for, um, for, for indoor visualization and indoor routing. So now let's have an example routing. Um, this picture shows our um, journey planner. And um, the map you see is already vector-based. It's a, a vector tile-based map. Um, on the lower left, uh, we do have a bar with which we can change the level which is visualized in the map. Uh, we will see this in, uh, for the following slides. Um, I would like to follow the orange root graph with you and show you some mapping examples. So we will start on this uh, stairwell there, out there at, at the starting point. That's um, shown here. So we do have our stairs, we do have elevators. That's a classical example for such a stairwell, it's fixed staircase, escalators, and elevators. And they all have their specific tags. Um, so we need the information um, which levels these um, stairs connect. And for this, we communicated with the community, with local communities, and come up to uh, this uh, scheme that we do map um, the connecting nodes with a level tag. This gives us information which um, levels are connected. Then, of course, we do have connecting ways. In the level minus one, we do tag. We do tag everything with the extra uh, uh, tag level and uh, an indoor uh, tag if it is inside the building. Now we are 
uh, in the level minus one and uh, following the root graph directly to the next um, stairwell. Um, please uh, note on the left side, we do have a textual information that's a turn by turn direction which is given out and uh, especially note that we do have information about which sign we uh, shall follow in the following. We will see this signs even in the following pictures I will show you again and um, this information is all out of the OpenStreetMap data processed. Here is a picture up from the Stachos um, Passagen, the level minus one and the root graph follows a way which is um, mapped in the data set and uh, in this case it's not just virtual um, data which is um, mapped for routing purposes but um, it's a real world objects. In this case, it's a tactile tabling system. We do see here. Okay, then we do have shops, of course, and amenities, and um, we do show them, uh, of course, too, because they are important uh, to recognize the uh, environment, and uh, they can contain additional information like uh, opening hours and uh, contact information, which we can use in our journey planner too. This is the um, following uh, stairwell we have seen in our uh, route uh, uh, earlier. And uh, please note on the upper left side the two, um, the, the S and the U sign, which we have seen earlier. So we do go um, to the level minus two. And here uh, we follow the route graph again and um, go into side, inside the, the tunnel to the next stairwell. So we follow the route, and again, we do have a lot of shops which we can uh, tag with their specific uh, tags. And uh, please note, in this picture, we do have an elevator, we do have three escalators, and a fixed stair uh, case, of course. And, um, with this information, we can improve the OpenStreetMap data set. We do map them, and you will see them now in our uh, map here, in the level minus four. We see the elevator sign. Then we see three um, escalators and the fixed <laughs> staircase. Um, with the direction, we can um, um, visualize the direction too. So if the escalator connects the down leading level and is moving forward, we can put on it some arrows which um, visualize the direction. Here we uh, get down to the uh, next um, level. So we came from the escalator where the guy stands and get down um, to our goal, to the platform in the underground, which is located at level minus five. That looks like so. So that's just a very short example of um, how we do uh, take our data. It's all photos we've taken and uh, from which we do get our information, what's uh, available and what's um, taggable and what's usable. So every um, object is a potential um, usable information and there's much, much more. That's just a small selection I've showed you of what is a uh, map mappable and uh, taggable in the data set. You can also tag some benches or bins or informations or other shop types and uh, extra attributes like opening hours, like I mentioned, uh, which we can do use for um, our journey planner afterwards. Now let's have a short comparison of how we do visualize our data. Um, the classic um, is uh, the bitmap tiles. Um, we do have bitmap tiles, we do use them, and other uh, mapping services do this uh, too. Um, they are widely used and they uh, are uh, wide, well working um, on mobiles and on uh, desktops as well. They are um, optimized for, for the screens, um, but we are um, working with vector data at the moment because uh, vector data ha has some um, um, points which, uh, which uh, bitmap tiles don't can um, serve. 
Let's take a look at this. So concerning speed, um, uh, bitmap tiles are fast and are working very well as mentioned, but uh, canvas um, tiles can be as fast as two um, and parts even faster. So we do see here the size of the two tiles. Um, on one hand we do have the, on the, on the right side we do have the um, bitmap tile with 45 kilobytes and on the other hand we do have the vector tile with 26 kilobytes. Uh, please note that we do have in the vector tile uh, five more levels, six with the ground level, and that's much, much data which is uh, stored in inside this tile, while we do only have one level in the bitmap tile. Concerning size, as mentioned, and uh, concerning attributes, uh, where the bitmap tiles don't have any attributes stored, so it's uh, just a raster picture um, with uh, pixel information, uh, while the vector tiles do have attributes, the features inside can have attributes, and uh, these attributes are usable, very good. Um, concerning rendering, as mentioned, the bitmap tiles are optimized for um, viewing on, on mobile or on desktop solutions, um, but if you do a zoom in, you will see a, a slightly blurring, a slightly uh, unsharpening, and while vector data hasn't this problem, you can zoom in as much as you want, the data gets rendered properly and um, looks very sharp. Concerning interaction, um, you can't really interact with the bitmap tile, while you can do this with a, a vector-based tile. You can select the features, you can highlight them, you can um, open pop-ups on it, and um, that's uh, really great. Data status, um, bitmap tile, uh, needs to get calculated again after you make some changes to the data set. Um, you need to calculate all the data again and um, uh, this costs time. While on uh, vector-based maps, you can change the data set in, the, in your geographic system and um, you will see the effect um, right, in, right in, then in, in, your, in your map. Highlighting, as mentioned, is possible in, in vector-based maps, but um, this would hardly work in bitmap-based tiles. Indoor information, so as you have seen, we are able to visualize uh, indoor information in vector-based tiles. While this wouldn't work this way in bitmap-based bitmap tiles. Yes, another picture shows um, the example for, for size and speed. Um, we have here a tile with uh, one feature and um, here we see how, how small the vector-based tile is um, and uh, in, in comparison to this, how large the bitmap tile is. So the less features we do have in one tile, the less the uh, size is. Um, bitmap tiles ha do have a limitation because of their uh, pixel system, um, what isn't available in um, and vector-based tiles. We do have only features, and they can do have uh, some attributes, and that's it. We also have a mobile journey planner. That's our app. It's Android-based, and um, it's developed in parallel to our uh, web-based map. Um, please note that we do have here also um, direction signs, which we can use. It's, they come all out of OpenStreetMap data. And um, they use the same data source and the same style sheets. But it's uh, absolutely parallel to the web map developed. What are our future tasks? We are uh, developing now um, an app to, for, for iOS, of course. And we are looking forward to um, have an app, um, a hybrid app, so a web map, which is portable for other open uh, operating systems. And um, we, we are looking forward to unify our mapping schemes and um, to uh, come together with the community. We are um, uh, often on some meetings, open street map meetings with the community and discussing and improving our mapping schemes. If you're interested in our mapping schemes, just visit the OpenStreetMap uh, wiki 
and uh, search for MENS and you will um, find our mapping schemes then. With this, I would like to finish my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thanks very much. Herr Kutlow, by the way, also worked here or did this PhD uh, studies here. And um, now he's doing it on a much different scale. Who has the point? So I think it's quite a good idea because it's uh, expanding also in dimensions which are often used by many people. Also, I remember you went to München and you said, how did you measure all these kind of Stachus areas? And he said at the beginning, well, more or less like a traditional measure. And to graphs, on the other hand, also it was interesting to see it takes a bit of force to capture the data, but it's also feasible and possible to do. Of course. So MENS is not a data uh, supplier and we don't uh, serve any data by our own self. Um, while we are working with OpenStreetMap, we um, do collect uh, OpenStreetMap data, of course, but we do this a classic way like all the other OpenStreetMap are too. So like the community, we go outside, take our photos like you have seen them uh, earlier, and uh, we have our flying papers, we take our notes, and then uh, we get back to our workplace and uh, map this data, this actual data. So um, as you have seen, we have our photos, and with these photos, with our notes, we can have micro-mapping, we can do micro-mapping, and uh, I think that's important, that's the next step in uh, the journey planner for barrier-free pedestrian routing, for example, especially for mobility-impaired people, and yes, that's uh, how we do map. So in future, we want to see that the community gets more uh, interested and active in, in development in open street map and, and mapping uh, indoor structures, especially. Good. Uh, by the way, I have also a Google Tango project here, a Google Tango device. Um, so if you're interested, maybe if things getting, get a bit better, um, you can play with. We organized it also. Uh, with the help of Philip, he brought it from America to Berlin because it, for, it was only available for pure U.S. citizens at the time and, and he is very often in Silicon Valley, so he brought it as well to us. So it's available here, which may change a bit the future. We have do, done also some experiments on this, um, but things continue. So thanks very much for your talk, Mr. Kutlo. And now the next one is Henry. And you will open it, or there are two of them. And which one do you open it? So um, I, the, you also, um, another approach to this part, I think it was originally Supported also by the German ministry, wasn't it? Yeah. Ministry for Federal, Federal for Economics and Technology, or at the time Energy yeah. now. BMWE. Yeah, in German. <laughs> change a bit. So, quite a large project, uh, and looking forward to hear uh, your perspective. Okay, yeah. Hello, welcome everybody. My name is Henry Echels. And, um, yeah, I want to talk about um, navigation systems or challenges of navigation systems um, to assist blind and visually impaired people in planning and finally finding their way. So it's called going the safe way, providing safe and barrier-free pedestrian navigation. And yeah, it's more talk about the challenges, the problems, less about the solutions. About the solutions we can also talk later if you want. Okay, let's start with an example. Um, did you or have you ever been ambling along the Kudam or the Friedrichstraße? Um, so Berlin offers a lot of nice places. I think you know, I know, um, like the Friedrichstraße to enjoy, have a walk there, go shopping and so on. And now try to imagine um, to pass all these places, the ways, with your eyes closed. So can you imagine what will happen? Um, I can because we tested it and it can become 
really dangerous. So, um, for example, um, normal street furniture, like the lights, the traffic lights, and some bullets, and so on, um, are now um, obstacles uh, which are potentially risky for you, right? And you need uh, information about it. Um, another example, can you remember how you came here? So the last mile, um, the footpath to this building here. And this is an example um, calculated with Graphhopper on OSM data. Um, we have here the underground station and on the top you have the building here. And yeah, it's not, not the uh, nearest underground station, but it's also a problem when you find the right exit, right? Which is nearest to your final destination. Um, so let's assume we start here, and let's check now um, how the way looks like in reality. So we have here one Google Street View picture, and the first interesting um, topic is crossing, crossing a street. So what do I have to know to cross a street? I have to know that there is um, a traffic light. And it would be nice to know if it's a traffic light for blinds or if the traffic light has a push button, right? I have to activate it. If I don't know it, I stand there a long time. Um, the same, the traffic light also has another function. It's an obstacle because it's directly in the middle of the way. Um, and maybe I need also information about the curbs, so the border between the street and the, and the uh, sidewalk. And uh, here you have also an example for an island between the streets. I need the information that there is one, right? That I can stop there. Um, another example, if we follow the calculated way, we have to here move, uh, we come from the right and have to move right. So what's this? What the hell? An obstacle, um, um, yeah, which, uh, can become really dangerous if you try to take the way without seeing anything. So let's assume um, the person is not going this way and is going straight on. Um, finally, you arrive at this situation here, coming from the right again. And also at this place, I think it would be really nice to have the information that there are some bollards and that there is a vehicle exit so that vehicles can cross my way. Okay. Um, that's the project behind this. Um, M4Guide, it is called. On the, on the bottom, you see all the partners. It's a bigger project. And yeah, I call it now Safe Routes for Blind and Visually Impaired People. And um, I gave you only examples about the outdoor environment. Um, M4Guide is a door to door project, so which means um, really have to assist the blind and visually impaired people for the entire way. So starting at the home, um, using public transport and also um, going through the buildings, especially if you go to the underground. So having information about the obstacles um, at the underground station and also uh, to know um, if you are in the right bus and when do I have to get out of the bus, right? So we have three contexts, outdoor, indoor, public transport. Um, today, I only want to talk about um, the outdoor problems or the problems or the challenges we face uh, in the outdoor environment. Um, if you need more information, uh, you can contact me and I can forward your contact, contacts or something like this. Okay, and yeah. Why IVU? IVU Traffic Technologies, that's a company I'm working for and we are part of the project. Um, the main business briefly is the public transport, so providing software solutions here for planning disposition but also operation. One interesting beispiel, not here in Berlin, is in London, so the passenger info for all the buses and stops there. And also private transport um, now or today an interesting topic. And also here, we have a solution for the post bus. Um, I'm working in the department which is a bit smaller and deals with location intelligence. And here, um, yeah, our main focus or the main topics are on the one side, um, location analysis, um, finding the best location uh, for your suits. So planning, in this case, Deutsche Post planning a bunch of offices or the media planning. So 
of Einkauf aktuell, that's a bunch or a bundle of advertisements and they want to optimize the distribution of it, right? And on the other side, the second topic is um, true optimization, especially on demand in the use case of express services. Okay, but that's it. And um, back to the topic. Um, in the headline, you have the safe way, going the safe way. Um, but you have to decide what is the safe way. And um, of course, this is somehow application oriented, or um, it depends more on, the, on your community. Um, a common definition, it was in German, I, hope I, tra I translated it uh, correctly. Um, a state in which you feel well protected against hazard or harm. Um, also here, um, it's, it's a feeling, right? So um, it depends always on the persons or on the community. And um, to bridge the gap between these, this final state and the data you have, um, you have, you have some factors, or so you, you define some safety factors. In our case, so navigation for blind and um, visually impaired people. Uh, for example, you can use um, highly frequented roads, right? Crossing highly frequented roads is one safety factor. Or another one are passing obstacles. Um, so that is common, that's general for the whole community. But there are also or um, the safety factors also depend on personal sense. Um, an example is the width of the foodway. Um, someone who uses a blind man's stick um, has no problems with um, a narrow food path, right? He, because he is able using the stick and finding the border on the left and on the right and pass the way. Someone who is using a guide dog um, has a problem with narrow ways because the dog is um, going next to the person and if you have then some lights or some some other obstacles it can become really tricky to pass a, a small or a narrow way so it's pretty customized and yeah the final output is here right safest route is mostly not the shortest route um, so you have other factors here um, let's assume we have a route a safe route now um, what comes next now you have to guide along the route. And it's obvious, of course, that you have to provide more information than normal navigation systems, but you have less channels, right? The complete visual channel is not usable. So you can't use maps and, and, and show on maps and talk about maps. So finally, um, we identified the biggest challenge is the balance of amount of information because you, we provide here, in this case, the information via speech and um, it's really tricky to find um, a balance. So provide not too much information because this can be annoying or tricky if the person has to concentrate on the traffic, for example. Also don't provide too less information and leave the, the person alone. So also, um, Hard. And yeah, finally, you have to end up like inform just, just about the ticket at the right time and the proper place. So you have to decide what do I have to tell and what not, when do I have to do it, and of course, where. That are the big questions. The fourth, the fourth question, of course, is how. Is also an interesting topic, human-computer interaction. How do I provide the, the information at its best? But um, is not part of the project and also not part of this uh, presentation. So don't wonder. Okay, to assist blind and visually impaired people, um, in the outdoor environment we have four modules, let's say. First is navigation, of course. That's the final product which is used by, by the end user. Um, and I picked out only two in interesting topics, which is what is required. First, a kind of preview. Blind people need uh, a really detailed preview of the entire way so that they are able to inform about the way before they start and also identify critical situations and uh, maybe also dangerous parts of the way. So that is something which is standard. You have a list of waypoints with actions in it, right? You have to turn right, you have to cross this and this street and so on. And from this, you need 
a text, a complete text, which can be spoken via the device to the blind. So this is one interesting topic. The other one is um, the deviation, um, calculation of deviation. And here are four types of deviation on the right side that are uh, that is a spatial deviation that is standard for all the navigation systems. So recognizing when uh, someone leaves the route, um, is not on the route, and then to decide uh, either please go back or uh, recalculate the route, right? Um, there are different, um, let's say, thresholds. When to, when to do what? Of course, we had to also to implement this, but that's more standard. On the left side, we have something which is uh, required in this application and um, it's first time deviation and um, we are in an intermodal context so um, the person is going to reach a bus or the subway or something like this so um, time is a critical point and we have to um, provide him with information about is the bus reachable or not and how to react if it is not so maybe he needs another vehicle, so it's changed to um, the subway. The other one, um, and which is also really tricky in, uh, in reality, is um, the deviation of direction. So we have to give um, some information about orientation. So the, the blind people have to know where to go, especially when they start somewhere. And of course, if you have small curves like this, um, that have to, you have to tell somehow. Second one is positioning. Um, it's not part of our work. Um, I only briefly talk about it. Um, you need high, precise positioning to provide or to assist blind people. For example, of course, you want to know or you want to tell on which side of the street the person is. Right? And you want to tell him in five meters there's an obstacle, pay attention on it. If the GPS or the positioning in common is 10 meters behind you, right, um, you, you, you fail um, in, in, in telling him that there, uh, that there is an obstacle. And another one is, of course, um, what do you do when um, your position is on the, on the footpath, but um, the device tells you, hey, no, you're here at this position and the accuracy is pretty good. That's why the bullet is green. Um, how do you react on, on this? And here I can tell you only using GPS or GNSS is or doesn't fit the needs within the cities because the accuracy um, yeah, is not good enough. You need uh, further solutions. Routing, I talked about it. You have to provide customized and application-specific routing. Um, here, we worked together with the people, talked about and defined profiles at first. So um, we have, I think, around 40 or 50 parameters, um, which have, each parameter has its own weighting, and the weighting influences the route, right? And we discussed um, which parameter should we have one weighting? Uh, uh, which weighting, yeah. And the second one is, of course, of course, the customization. So at the end, you use your profile. Let's say I'm visually impaired. I use the, the profile, but I want to um, customize it during the request. Okay. And last one, most important, I would say, data. Um, no service without data, and of course, if you want to have um, um, yeah, um, high accurate navigation, you need high accurate data. So you have to know that um, there is the food pass, that there is an exit for vehicles, and you have to know all the information about the crossing there. Here, this is the situation in um, in the data model. So we we looked for me to the crossing. And um, finally, in this project, we were pretty lucky because in the preparation phase, it was defined that we collect the data in a test environment and um, collect all the important information for the blind people. So at the crossing line there, so or at the line representing the crossing, we have 
um, the information that there's a traffic light. We have the information that there's an island between the streets. We have a paved surface there. And also pretty important is that you have tactile indicators for the crossing. That's everything in it. And this is something you need to um, use it in the routing engine, right? And of course, to use it in the navigation to finally provide the information. Okay, that's it. The last slides, um, yeah. The bottom line is that, or what you should take with you if you are interested in this topic. Um, you need highly accurate data, flexible and personalized routing, and high precision positioning to finally inform just about the ticket at the right time and at the proper place. Um, the, the project is in an end phase now. Now we, the, the, the testing phase is starting now. And it, um, we will learn a lot, I think. And maybe we can't, uh, or can't have for everything a solution, but um, we can improve the situation for the blinds. And this is something we learned until now. I also picked, again, only three points out of it. The first one, less is more. Um, I, I saw that at the beginning. I said it at the beginning that um, if you talk too much, right, to the to the person, the person is annoyed and can't concentrate on the on the on the different things which are important now at the situation. The second point is the more information you provide, the more wrong information you provide, and this is really really tricky to filter out which information my device currently or the algorithm currently produced is wrong and uh, which uh, information I don't or I can't provide to the end user. So, um, pretty hard. Then the semantics problem, half left is precisely not half left. So, um, we had first tests and of course um, you have to find another solution than um, saying now turn half left, because it's different. And uh, the last one is a summary. The world is complex a place. Um, it is, each time we went out and test the software or parts of it, um, we've, um, we are come from, uh, we had situations, conditions in the road network where we were not able to guide through the situation, which is usable for a blind or visually impaired person. So. Um, especially here in Berlin. Okay, last two slides. Only um, um, what we have developed, that is only one point um, called EVO navigation because that's new for us. Um, we built a component and interesting here is that it's a co component you can use in the background. You have an API and um, the nice thing is that you can decide on your own if you integrate it, what information I want to provide, what not, and how I want to provide it. Of course, you can also provide all the information on the map. That's also possible. And that are the systems where it is currently uh, integrated or very integrated now. On the left side, the uh, research projects and Forget and Dynamo. And on the right side, of course, we have a known prototype to test all the functionality. And if we work for mobile is one of our products. And on the back end, on the service side, currently we have the routing engine connected and next steps would be, or it would be nice also to um, connect our geo service, the other geo services for geocoding and map representation. And finally, that's always an interesting topic in research project, what happens after, what, ha what happens to all the solutions um, of the project. Here again, we were, or we are really lucky. We have um, as partners the VWB BVG in the project, which are the service provider for public transport here in Berlin, and they have a journey planner called Far Info. Um, and within the Far Info, we provide these the last mile routing, so the routing for the pedestrians. And this is the concept, or this is how we want to integrate it in the next year. We have a component also developed in a research project called EVO Routing Proxy, which is able to decide, uh, depending on um, the vehicle or profile of the request, which um, road network uh, or which graph uh, is to use or has to be used. 
And that is pretty important because they have an infrastructure, they have OSM data, and this works really fine, and they don't want to leave it out. So we have to add only a new graph um, on another server, and the software should decide um, who is provided with which information. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. One point. Otherwise, I suggest um, that we start now with a break. It, could, it was a bit hearable already, and we're running a bit late. I think, anyway, it's quite important work also to go to see how detailed things have to be. Um, the, the blind approach is something which might be, of course, considered the big a special case, but it's a good training case also to train these things. And also, if there's some public money to push some activities, it's also a good idea. Yeah, and thanks very much for this session. We got a break now, and then there will be the next one. See you soon.